name, man. Hi, my name is Matt, Ranger Matt, and welcome to another day with Slick, a better you. Over the last three years, I've had the pleasure of meeting many different people, book authors, pastors, singers, motivational speakers, people from television, people from the daytime serial world, and people from Disney. Why am I asking you this? I already know this. You're from where I'm at, Baltimore native. <laughs> Over these three years, I've heard many excellent stories. I've had many wonderful conversations, good laughs, and I've always enjoyed hearing stories from people in terms of how they got from point A to point B to where they are today. I've had a blast doing this, and I can't wait to see what else is in store. So sit back, relax, and here's a new episode of Slick, A Better You. Yeah, what are you going to do, you know? That's a, it's a messed up family. Well, hey guys, how y'all doing today? Welcome to another day with Slick, a, a better you, P.E. Slick podcast. Happy New Year to you guys. Um, It's been a while since I've done one, so this is the first podcast for 2023. I'm excited to have this guest on. He's a friend of mine who has uh, blown us away as the a villainist, Ashton Locke, when you're in the wrestlers, but we still love him today as Bud. Well, Josh Lewis. <laughs> you know, um, I got um, a couple of clips on the air. Uh, I'm happy that he's here, you know. This is the tale of the Sun Country kid that rode into town, a horse he called Sid. He met a young man named Bill who told me he was from Springfield. He said, why don't you come by and meet my uncle Josh? But then when I heard his background, I said he might need to watch, you know, with Sonny, Annie, Olivia, and Reba. No, I don't mean the singer Reba. Then he became Ashlyn Locke, who didn't give a flying flock, but let me stop. I'm not going to keep going. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Newman is in the house. I'm happy he's that here. Was, hey, Robert. Hey, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> well done <laughs> uh, thank you you know and i didn't eat notes i you know right on top of my there head <laughs> well done and i was going to show you uh real quick uh yesterday i met my god children i have a, a god son and daughter and son and daughter and a niece and nephew and this is me with him yesterday there i am oh man that's so great that's so sweet <laughs> How old? Uh, they're one. He's one now. Him, and, that's David and his sister Nora. I don't have Nora's picture. I'm waiting for my buddy to send it to me. But yeah, right. I finally got to see him yesterday. That's great. I'm very happy for you. Thank you. And how are you, Mister Godfather? How are your well, grandchildren? As, as doing? you guys, as you probably know, I now have two grandsons. Right. Uh, Leo Robert is about uh, is probably getting to two and a half ish, and. Mm -hmm. uh, Rocky Joseph is uh, going to be coming up on her, his uh, first year. He was uh, an April Fool's Day baby, April 1st. Oh, um, my. <laughs> and both of them have just completely and utterly um, stolen my heart away. I mean, they are they just mean everything to me now. It's um, uh, the time that we have with them is exhausting. And at the same time, it's extraordinary, you know. Right. Um, and, and and every time we're with them for like a, my wife and I'll go re watch them for like three or four days sometimes when uh, our son and daughter in law want to be out of town. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I just constantly am thinking to myself, God, this was so much easier when I was 30 years old <laughs> you know, because now I spend a few days like throwing them around all over the place. I got them up in the air and I'm throwing them over my shoulders and down my back and all kinds of stuff. And right my whole body just hurts <laughs> for like a week after that. <laughs> I hear but, you. Uh, man, I love those boys. I really and what you mean? You're still in your 30s, man. You're still like, you, you can run a mile and not get tired. Yeah, no. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. no. Well, um, as people have known, like I said in the intro, uh, for a brief while, you were Ashlyn Locke. Um, how did that come about for you i know that was a, a recast yeah i got a call about this time last year it was kind of early january um from my agent that ynr was interested in this uh for me for this recast in la mm -hmm. uh, and you know i live in 
Stanford, Connecticut. So this is a, you know, this is, that, that's already an issue, mm. but uh, you know, they were looking for three or four months, I think at that time. And I said, yeah, I, I'll think about it. I can, you know, let's go ahead and take the next step and, and you can start talking to them about that. And then they came back and I've told this story before where they came back and suddenly they wanted a three-year contract, three years. And I was like, no, I, I'm not going to move out to L.A. right now. That's just not going to happen. But let's talk about some other things. And um, we finally landed on a um, basically a, a, just to make it easier to understand, basically a six month, two six month options totaling a year. Right. Yeah, but the idea was uh, pretty much always that they were going to probably kill off this character by the end of that first uh, six month deal, which is what happened. Right. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I really I only had a few days to sort of get my get myself together, get myself moved out to Los Angeles uh, for what would be, I knew, at least uh, six months. Mm. And uh God, they sent me. I think I had. I think I had five scripts in the first three days on that show. Five episodes wow. in the first three days on that show. Wow! And I had about um, I don't know less than a week to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. I had never watched the show, so I didn't know anything about um, the character really. I had a <laughs> uh, a Zoom meeting with the head writer um, Josh and the executive producer at that time, and. Um, they filled me in on a lot of background of the character. And um, I just did the work that I had done a hundred times before and uh, figured out how I wanted to play the character and uh, uh, got thrown in there in the studio and uh, started work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was ironic for my mother, you know, cause you know, she like everybody else, she's known you for years as Josh Lewis and um, she's getting ready to turn 60. 667 this year, one of the two. Yeah. And um, when she first saw you, she was like, Josh Lewis in General City. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Your first scenes with Robert, I mean, um, Eric Brayton, it was just like, you know, Josh and Victor Newman. It's ironic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also for a lot of my Guiding Light fans to see me play such a nasty character, I think was, was they had to do quite a, a lot of mental gymnastics to kind of figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was Very it like working with Amelia, Victoria? Amelia? Yeah. Amelia's great. You know, mm -hmm. I, she's a she's a professional through and through. And I, I, you know, I always thought for her it must have been a little tricky to to go from, you know, uh, one guy playing this role to another guy playing this role in in probably less than a week. I don't know exactly the time frame of the last time. Sorry, his name just went out of my head. The actor that played the role before I took it over. I Richard. Took, Richard Berge. Yeah. Um, I don't know when Richard was on in the studio, the last time he was in the studio, but it was probably only a few days before I was in the studio. And so, uh, you know, to work with somebody like him for six months and then have somebody like me come in just like that must have it must have been a big transition for her, too. Um but, you know, right from the very beginning, she was very much open to anything I threw at her, which was right. great. <laughs> and because uh, because I was again, I didn't I never saw Richard's performance, but I, I know we're very different kinds of actors. So, uh, you know, I, I imagine there were quite a few differences there for her to to think about. Um and then as, as our time progressed together, I felt like we became, you know, we became a good team. It was a tough story to tell, I think, you know, for actors. I think for on her, for her, I, I don't want to speak for her, but I, I've been in a situation before where I know when you're the actor who's, when you're playing the character who's being conned or played by somebody else, it's always a difficult situation because you feel like your character is always like why would my character you know believe this why would my character do this why would my you know that happens a lot right you know, I, i've been through enough uh on guiding light i've been through enough <laughs> annies and sunnies and you know uh uh, uh olivia riva cassie uh, you know <laughs> where, where i was constantly being sort of played or conned in some form in some way I know as the actor, it's tough because you've got to continually sort of 
motivate your actions as the character, but, but with your eyes a little bit closed to how you think you might ha handle that situation. So for her, I would imagine that was a, that was a deal, but I will say, you know, all the times that uh, uh, Ron Raines or Chris Berno or Michael Zaslow had told me about how great it is to play a bad guy. Uh, it's pretty great to play a bad guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was something different, you know, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, yeah. I play a lot of bad guys on stage, you know, Sweeney Todd's a bad guy, you know, right. uh, Sidney Brule and death trap is a bad guy. George and Virginia Wolf is a bad guy. I mean, to, to some extent, yeah, but uh, but on the soap, it's it's just fun because you get to just say these outrageous things to other characters, and they pretty much have to stand there and and take it to some extent. Right. Um, but I, I I I developed a pretty good relationship with most of the actors on the show, and um, you know, some I saw more frequently than others, uh, but but uh, you know, overall, it was a pretty great experience. Yeah, it seemed like a fun ride, and uh, yeah. I have to say, you uh, you look good for a dead man who got his <laughs> lights knocked out, and then they threw your body in the car and took it off the victim. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I don't know what happened to Ashlyn after I shot my last scene because uh, you know, again, I don't, you know, other than bits and pieces I picked up on social media, there was something. I know the body disappeared, and yeah, I was there for that, but otherwise, I, I you know, something about. What, what, how did, what did you say? Something about a well, um, F and a I'll, body I'll, I'll, and... I'll blow the whistle for you. He, uh, they, uh, Victor had his men, uh, throw his body in the car and it went off a cliff. So they, they think you, it like actually, a crash. Yeah, yeah, they did that, but it was all Victor. <laughs> okay, makes sense, <laughs> <laughs> man. Um, what do you think it is about daytime that still draws fans even today? I mean, I'm sure there's still people who, when they see you, they still call you Josh Lewis and now Ashlyn and other things you've done. Well, I, I, I think I can actually kind of address that from um, in this way that uh, I'm thinking about the people that I meet now who were who followed Guiding Light for all those years and how um they're just so sad still about the show not being on the air anymore you know that it's just really you can tell i've had people break out in tears with me on the you know on the street or in a mall or something because they just miss the show so terribly right and i think you know that i think that because of the the five day a week uh nature of soap opera five episodes a week that people just really get um these characters all become part of their family, mm -hmm. right? And they feel like they're they're a family member with the Lewises or with the Spaldings, and and um, and and they really want to know what's going on with Josh and Reva. You know, I have people all the time ask me like, "What do you think Josh and Reva are doing now?" And I'm like, you know, my logical mind is like, they're characters in a play; they don't exist. You know, they're not real. But I know what they're asking. I think. I mean, and sometimes I'll jokingly say, well, I think Kim's in New Jersey right now with her grandkids and I know I'm doing this play over, you know, or whatever. But but I think that they, you know, they they want to know, like they want to kind of figure out like where would sometimes I'll say um, they're probably on their fifth marriage by now to each other. And in the interim, the last decade or more they probably both been married to someone else. <laughs> yeah. for Josh and Reba. Um, but, you know, I think that people really get attached to these characters, you know, and, uh, um, and I think that's true on any of the soaps. I think it's the, I think it's the five episode a week nature of the storytelling. Right. And, you, you know, and you see people complain all the time on social media about, the storyline being good or bad, or my, the, this character would never do this, or this character would never do that. The, you know, that's all part of it too. So it's sort of that, like a big dysfunctional family, you know, right? That, that you know, sure, it may be tough at Thanksgiving and Christmas, but you love your family and they're part of who you are, and and you would hate to be without them, right? So when the, when a show like Guiding Light goes away. I think that's when you really see how attached people were to the show, whether they were even aware of it or not. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I didn't ask you this the last time I talked to you. I mean, I don't know if you could share a little light on this, but I was going to ask you um, if you recall your experiences. And I, and I found a clip or two that I have, and it's, some of it's in the tribute that I got. We're going to play in a few. But uh, what was your experiences like? Um, you was on General Hospital as Prescott and Santa Barbara yeah. as Kirk. And I know Kirk was kind of a bad guy on Santa Barbara. Yeah, so was Prescott. Mm -hmm. uh, I held Holly hostage on a train. I remember that was Emma Sam's, I think. Yeah, I yeah. kidnapped her and held her hostage on a train for what seemed like forever. I was only on the show for, I think, four months or something. They were very different experiences. I, uh, you know, and, and this is, this will sound disparaging toward General Hospital, but this, keep in mind, this is, this is in 1980. Uh, 85. <laughs> Yeah, 85. You know, this is a long decades ago, but mm -hmm. you know, General Hospital was and Gloria Monty was still there. And she and I just didn't click because uh, Gloria ran her studio on fear and paranoia. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, you know, she really blew up at actors and directors all the time. She was people were constantly feeling like they could be fired tomorrow. This was my take on the show. Right. And uh, and I was only there, you know, on a short term contract, you know, uh, but I'm not easily intimidated. <laughs> I don't function well under uh, fear in, in our guiding light world. As as wonderful as a guy as Paul Roush could be, he was very much the same way where he really ran that studio hard. And uh, right. he, didn't, he blew up at actors, you know, constantly. And uh, could be very demeaning. I think about in today's current culture, I don't think a Paul Roush could survive or a Gloria Monty for that matter. I think they, 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 somebody would bring them up on some kind of charges or something like that. But, right. um, you know, I just didn't respond to her. And I think that really made her nuts. And, um, and also the character on General Hospital wasn't really what I kind of hoped it was going to be. Mm. You know, it was it, it it was fine, but uh, my time there, I don't really have any particularly fond memories of. I remember liking a lot of the actors I was working with, right? Uh, and then you cut to to uh, Santa Barbara, and uh, you know, I, I that was just a six week thing where I came in and wreaked havoc and then left, and <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I liked the short term, like come in, do something terrible and go away kind of thing. I was right. Uh, that role was replacing um, Joseph Bottoms, who was uh, Sam right. Bottoms uh, and Timothy Bottoms' brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would come in as this character once a year or so for six weeks, wreak havoc and leave. And at one point they had him written in, but he had to go shoot a movie in Hawaii, I think, or something like that. And they called me and I came in and played the role for that six weeks. And uh, and I and I really was, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed a good friendship with A. Martinez while I was working there and, and then several of the other people there, too. I liked Santa Barbara. And, and at the end of my run on Santa Barbara, I remember sitting with Jill Farron Phelps. Right. Who I think was a producer on that show, not the executive producer, I don't think. Mm -hmm. and saying, you know, if you guys want me to come in for, you know, full time, I think I would be interested in that. But then, of course, I was back on Guiding Light you know, within the next couple of months. So, um, but I liked working on Santa Barbara and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the character. Um, got along great with A and Marcy and all that. And, you know, that was nice. It's ironic that, uh, you know, because uh, there's a few clips that I found of you on, on there. And it's ironic that uh, Marcy would later come on, got in light as Tangy. Yeah, that was a... That's that another was, one I forgot. Uh, <laughs> Even with so many yeah, females on that uh, show. <laughs> that was uh, doomed from the beginning in terms of the Josh Tanzi relationship. I remember I remember they did a ton of publicity with the two of us before she even started. Mm -hmm. And it was all talking about chemistry and and how great these characters were going to be together. And I, and, I, and I remember, you know, talking in interviews about it and you know, chemistry is not something that you can predict. Right. It really just isn't. It's, you know, it's something and it's not something you can you can predetermine is going to happen 
because it takes time for chemistry to happen. It just does. Right. You know, Kim and I have a chemistry together. We still have it today. Even when we're on stage today, there's a chemistry in our working together. But it's after years of working together. It, it's not something that's magical that happens, you know. And uh, and so I was I remember being concerned before they even started actually taping the story of Josh and Tanji that, you know, we're setting up a high bar here. We're setting up expectations for something really wonderful. And then to top it off, they didn't really write it, honestly. It was like. It just it was sort of like a secondary storyline that they uh, another issue there I remember having was that the characters had fallen in love right. off camera before she even arrived. Right. You never saw them on camera falling in love. And again, I think that that whole process is where the chemistry comes into play mm. in the daytime. Pardon that. We uh I live by a fire station, so it's like they, I don't know, it could be one in the morning and here they come. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I I didn't, I mean, I've, I've seen episodes, of course, from over the years and in the 90s when Marcy came on and um, I didn't, I didn't really have a lot to say about that. Plus, it was really brief because she didn't stay on too long. And then when she was with you, they paired her with Rick Hurst and Ron Rings and then she was gone. She wasn't on that long. And she went back to all my children. So I don't I kind of don't think her heart was in it for some reason. I just you know, I, I never felt like she really yeah, I don't know. I shouldn't get it go any further down that <laughs> road. But you know, I, I just uh you know, sometimes it's sometimes a show just isn't a good you know, I just got finished saying that my time on General Hospital, and remember both of those gigs for me, General Hospital and Santa Barbara, were post Guiding Light. Right. I'd already done my first three years on Guiding Light. And those gigs happened in the two years I was away from Guiding Light. Right. And uh so I had my soap opera chops pretty honed by then. Josh and Reaver were already a, a, a thing, right? Right. And um but for me, one was a good fit and the other one wasn't. And I, I think that that's that can happen, you know, on, on for any project. Yeah. You know, it's it's something about Josh and Reva, you know, even today. It's like they just the, those who, I'm, you know, no matter who was writing over the years, it's like they always wrote. And, and it's like you, you and Reva, other than Philip and Beth, Josh and Reva was like that solid couple in Springfield, even when they broke you up. Y'all always found your way back. Even at the end, I mean, they didn't really explain Jeffrey's, you know, they, 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 y'all thought yeah. he was dead, but he was chasing Edmund and alive. Then a year right. later, y'all ride off in this truck, and it's like, well, what happened with Jeffrey, though? We thought he was dead when he was chasing Edmund, but it's like, y'all just have this, you and Kim, it's just this this dynamic, you know, and that's something I've always loved. I mean, even watching as a kid, I thought y'all was like a natural couple because it was just, y'all clicked. You know? Well, again, that's a lot of decades of working together. Mm. It really is. I mean, it, it's just not something that happens, you know, magically or, you know, like in the first day. Uh, moving forward to uh, back to your question about uh, Ashlyn and Victoria, not right. so much about Amelia, but, you know, I, I, I had a sense in those first, you know, people talked about sort of a lack of chemistry Sometimes, you know, you'd see something posted on Twitter or whatever about the lack of chemistry right. between myself and Amelia. But I, I feel like, uh, first, you know, first of all, I came into the story right at the point when she starts suspecting that he's not really who he says he is anyway, or what he says he is anyway. Right. And then secondly, you know, again, it, it takes time, you know, we're, we're two very different actors and we're, we don't know each other. We've never met each other. And we're trying to sort of build this, you know, in a similar way to what I just said about Josh and Tangi falling in love off camera. I never got to play the scenes with Amelia where Ashlyn and Victoria actually fell in love. Right. My task was to play the scenes that he loved her completely which is something that the head writer and I talked about quite a bit in advance. Mm -hmm. So I had to come into the middle of that story. So the audience never saw me, Robert and Amelia playing the scenes that led up to whatever their relationship was. I just came in and sort of 
you know, so so I think there's that was a lot of the audience adjusting to a different actor playing the role, role Amelia adjusting to a different actor playing the role. And, you know, but again, by the t I felt like by the time we got to the end of that run, you know, she and I had found our rhythms with each other and, you know, it was working pretty well. Right. Plus, I guess it had to have been kind of like uh, a readjustment a little bit because you it, it's been some time since you've been on a soap opera since Gotten Light ended. Yeah, the first month yeah. was kind of out of body ish. Yeah. Yeah, because I was trying to, you know, get my brain to work in that way again and, you know, dealing with multiple pages every single day pretty much. Um, so I was, a lot of it was me doing a lot of technical work up here to get things to work properly in this format. It's such an unforgiving format. Right. It just is, you know, they want, they, they really, their hopes are to have everything in one take. They, they're very, uh, they, they will uh, adjust to it when it's not in one take, but you know, there's a lot of pressure to get things done at just this ridiculous speed. Um, and, and, you know, I would go in there some mornings at 7 a.m. and I'd have the first six scenes of the day. Right. I'd be walking out of the studio at 10 a.m. And on the golf course by noon. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how fast, you, you know, you'd rehear do some rehearsal. And then at, I think at 8.30, we'd start rolling tape. And if you had the first six scenes, you could be done and in, in, certainly be done in 90 minutes. Wow. You know, You're educating me. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm I'm learning as I go about it. I mean, because it's like, you know, for me growing up watching soaps, it's like I used to wonder would anything be improv. Like, 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 let's say you and Reva talk, and it went from like five or eight minutes long. That's a lot yeah. of dialogue to remember in like for eight nine minutes before it goes to commercial or somebody else's scene. Right. So that's, you know, I used to wonder that about soaps back then. It's like, did they ever improv anything? Because I remember I so much dialogue and they try to squeeze that knowledge in for like five, eight minutes, ten minutes long. That might be a lot on the brain. And then you might have other scenes to go before the end of the episode. Well, I think I've one might, episode a day, right? One is, uh, one of the nice things that they do on Young and the Restless is they really didn't write any scenes more than three or four pages long. Okay. Uh, back in the day, back when Doug Marlin was writing the show and Pam Long was writing, God, you know, the show on Guiding Light, we, Kim and I would have easily eight page scenes in the middle of the show. You mm -hmm. know, you have the short prologue, you have the short epilogue bookending a show, but, but in the middle of the show, you could easily have these, we would have eight page scenes. Sure. And where we would just be talking to each other for, like you said, eight minutes, nine minutes, 10 minutes, you know. I was thankful at Young and the Restless that the scenes were shorter because it gave you more of an opportunity, the ability to sort of cram something in, shoot it, and then forget it and go to the next one and cram right. that and shoot it. You know, but at Guiding Light, you really had to you really had to be well prepared uh, in a different way um, before you came to the studio on any given day. Because if right. you had those eight solid pages in a row and you had three or four of those scenes in a single episode, which could happen. You know, you really had to. Everybody had their own system, their own right. way of doing things, but uh, it, that could be really challenging, but also really rewarding because in those longer scenes, you could really have an arc that would take you, you know, from where you are at the beginning of a scene on this journey with, you know, Josh and Reva together. And where are they at the end of the scene? And then the bigger arc, which is where are they at the beginning of this episode? Where are they at the end of this episode? And then right. the bigger arc, which is the week and then the bigger of the month. You know, so everything sort of is a, you know, you're, you're looking for a journey. Right. That's what you want is a journey. As an actor, that's what you want to get you through the full episode. How am I different in the epilogue than I was in the prologue? Right. And that's the same thing whenever I do a play. Mm -hmm. Plays are much more, you know, predictable in that way. When I play Tevia or Sweeney or uh, Don Quixote, there's an arc that happens from the beginning of the play to the end of the play. And, and you take this fantastic journey in some of these roles mm -hmm. throughout the course of the play. And, and, and 
you know, the, the trick is where do you start and where do you finish? Okay. Um, I've seen you posted some clips on YouTube um, of some of you and Kim singing or you and Kim, uh, you singing at some of your theaters. And I seen one picture of, of you and I don't have it on me, but you would dress up as a cute woman. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Oh, uh, uh, Edna. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a great role. I love that role. <laughs> so, right. yeah, for Hairspray, the role of Edna, the mother, mm -hmm. is tradition is played by a man. That's that's the way John Waters wrote the film, right? That the musical was based on, and that's the way that's traditionally how the role is always played. Although, in the way things have changed now, right? In the, right. In the way we're casting now. Uh, I just had an interesting conversation with my daughter recently about whether or not Edna could be played. Like, why couldn't Kim Zimmer play Edna? She'd be great in the role. Why not? Right. You know? uh, but the the th that would go against the purposes of the original author, John Waters, because he wanted that role in particular to challenge people's thinking about um, gender. Right. This was back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. This wasn't now when we're talking about gender all the time. This was way back in the 50s, but he wanted to challenge the way people think about gender right. it, it, through that role. So, yeah, I I, um, I had the opportunity <laughs> to, to play Edna. I, uh, I My favorite story about that was I was looking for, um, I needed to find a pair of size 12 pumps, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is not easy to find, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember I was in Capizio, which is a very famous uh, shoe salesman for theater people down in um, New York on Broadway. Right. And I was trying on uh, all of these uh, women's shoes. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly the people next to me who were Italian suddenly said, Joshua? <laughs> Cintieri? Because, you know, in Italian, it's Cintieri. And, you know... It, Scotting Light was very famous in Italy. It still is today. Right. And so these people recognized me. And I always thought how funny this was that this Italian family recognized me in a shoe store while I was trying on women's shoes. And I thought, I wonder what story they've told about that over the years, you know? Um, yeah. And then they put you in, in, a, in basically in a fat suit because Ed is a very big woman. Mm -hmm. and uh the wig and the makeup and everything else and it was a joy it was weirdly it reminded me a lot of playing tevia because edna is the story of edna is the parent of a daughter in this case the mother of a daughter and the daughter is changing the way she thinks about traditional values throughout the entire play and of course tevia has three daughters who are constantly changing the way he thinks about traditional values to the court, but he loves them anyway. And Edna loves her daughter relentlessly anyway. Right. You know, the, to me, there were very similar kinds of roles actually. <laughs> well, Tony award. Robert <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're going to talk a bit about GL. I got some clips I'm going to show you. you, you know, I've been, um, you know, I've been in clips when I do, my interviews now uh but real quick one fan had asked because i got a few watching um what was your intake when toward the end of the show when they went from regular production shooting to do in the outside location yeah. kind of shooting it was tough it was just really tough it was really hard from our end because you know we all wanted it to work the best that it could but um it was just such a difficult um, transition to make you mm -hmm. know, for us too. It really was. Um, I, I got the idea of what they wanted. You know, Friday Night Lights was a big show back in those days. And, right. and uh, it was all shot sort of handheld and herky jerky and uh, sort of on the fly. It always looked like it was sort of on the fly and they were breaking fourth walls. Not, not really breaking fourth walls, but breaking the line of proscenium that is traditionally kept even when you're on doing camera work. Mm. So if you think about a soap opera set, it's three walls like a theater set would be, right? So in a theater set, you have three walls, two on the side, one on the back, and then the proscenium, which is the invisible fourth wall. 
right. so on a soap opera set you would have the same thing with the three cameras and they would but they would never break you would never a camera would never reposition itself on the back wall and shoot an angle from that side you know so you were always shooting in in these directions but when we right. started that handheld thing they were just all over the place and um and then outside in Peapack, New Jersey, and inside in these now permanent sets with four walls. They built permanent sets with four walls in them. Right. Um, and, you know, the lighting guys were trying to figure out, the sound guys were trying to figure it out, the camera guys were trying to figure out, we were trying to figure it out. And it was almost like if we had taken like three months dark and just worked on it ourselves i think then we would have come to a a pretty good system of shooting right but we can't on soaps you can't do that you have to you know there's a product you have to generate five days a week right and so to me all of the transition that should have taken place off camera if we were going to go to a system like that ha had to happen on camera and i do think by the time we got to the end of it Toward the end of that two-year period, we were kind of getting the hang of it. We were, we were figuring it out. Yeah. Um, and it was looking better. And I think the audience was just adjusting to what it was. And uh, But it was just a really, really difficult transition to make. Um, again, on our side, as much as it was for the audience watching it. Yeah, it, it took, I think it took again for me to adjust too, because it was like, you know, for me at first, I mean, I know I'm not, I wasn't a part of that decision, but it's like when you watch them that and you don't see, see that on the other soap operas, it's like, it's like a, a, some, a high school or a college behind the scenes film. <laughs> but, um, well, Brian Buffington kind of said that when I talked to him about it, because he commented on that. But, uh, you know, it, it, it took a while to adjust, but I, I kind of got the hang of it a bit toward the end. And like you said, by the time the show had ended, it, it was like everything was coming together and it was adjustable. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that would have kept going if the show was still on the air or not. But, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was new. And it, it, it was new to see, you know, getting shots of like you or somebody running in the park or at the yeah. store rick was eating a hot dog in the store once in, in a random scene but yeah yeah that well was... and i know like there would be exteriors where you'd have snow in one scene and not snow in the other scene and things like that i i saw those sometimes they sometimes they hit something just right i remember weirdly doing i don't remember what the context of the scenes were but i was in a graveyard outside with david mcdonald and what was the name of his character Edmund. Edmund. And um, and it started snowing right when we started shooting the scenes. And wow. I remember seeing those later, and they were beautiful. Mm -hmm. It really looked beautiful. You had real snow happening. We're in this graveyard. I mean, it was a really, they were really, they weren't, you know, romantic scenes or anything like that. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it was real. they were really beautiful shots, you know. Uh, and, and that was just like a happy accident that happened that day. Kind of like. If you go way back to Josh and Reba's first wedding, mm -hmm. there's a shot there that just grabs my heart every time I see it. And it's of Reba in the rowboat coming across the lake in that white dress with the big hat. And Morgan uh, Dillon is rowing the boat. And it's a gorgeous, it's such a beautiful shot. And the lighting was absolutely perfect in that moment on that day. And in a weird way, that's not to take credit away from Joanne, Sedwick, who directed that segment, but it was kind of luck of the draw that they happened to hit the lighting so perfectly in that shot. Right. You go back and look at it. It's a beautiful shot. You know, we had a couple of those from time to time in PPAC, but, um, and also keep in mind, though, that that whole change, the purpose of that change had to do with keeping us on the air for another two years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was thankful for that you know, not just for me, but for the fans, you know, uh, we would have been canceled flat out two years earlier if Ellen had Ellen Wheeler hadn't made a deal with CBS that we would go to this new format in order to save money, because that was the whole thing. To save right. money. Uh, if she hadn't struck that deal with them, we would have been off the air two years earlier than we were. <laughs> Some fans go, well, it sucked. You should have gone off the air. Other fans really? go, well, I'm glad we got two more years of storytelling. 
So, hmm. uh, but that, that was, you know, at least that's what we were told was the main reasoning behind it. Mm. And, in, and even now, when I worked on YNR, YNR, it's amazing to me how money just drives everything. Right. Everything. Or lack of money drives everything is what I should say. And mm. YNR actually spends money. But, but you'll notice in YNR, whenever you're in a restaurant or a bar, there's no one else there. Right. No customers, right? Right. There's maybe a maitre d' or a bartender, but there's no customers ever. And that's because in terms of budget, they can't afford anymore to bring on, uh, you know, 20 uh, 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 background performers to play customers in the restaurant while they're doing scenes in a, in a restaurant. They right. just can't afford it. So you've got empty restaurants, empty bars, empty hotel lobbies, everything. There's just aren't people there. You know, that's that's a budget driven issue. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, because I, I understand a little bit since you said that. Um, I got a clip I'm going to play. I was going to ask you to say a few words about this gentleman here that we recently lost. I got a clip of you two together. I'm going to play. You know, sometimes, yeah, it's a little tough. I mean, like like at, uh, 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 at bedtime. You've got, a, you've got a nine o'clock bedtime. You've got the whole routine worked out where, where you've got supper and, and games and then uh, brushing their teeth and all that stuff. You get them down into bed. You think they're asleep, right? Mm -hmm. You go downstairs, little alone time with your wife. It's the first chance you've had to relax. You're all, you're all just taking it easy. And all of a sudden, you hear a scream from upstairs, and they have lied to you. They're not sleeping. They are playing. In fact, Shane has stolen, what, what, Mara's a doll and is playing Operation Dolly Drop from the top of the stairs. And the whole thing starts all over. <laughs> <laughs> they lie in Jesus. Yes, they do. <laughs> so what keeps you going in all this? Uh, adrenaline and um, love. I'd like to keep her away from her brother, but that's a losing battle. Yeah, those two seem pretty close these days. You just sent a cold chill down my spine. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> you know that. That first scene right there, mm -hmm. that's good writing right there. <laughs> that was cracking me up. That was really good dialogue. I right saw there. you laugh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. God. See, that's a typical thing where somebody plays a scene and I have no memory at all about any of that scene at all. Right. But uh, Jerry Vadorn was, he's just everything, you know, he was the real deal. And he's everything that people say about him. He was everything that people say about him. Uh, you know, he there was no, he was a, a genuinely nice, giving, good man. And uh, and that's what everybody will tell you about Jerry Vadorn. That's what Grant will tell you and Michael will tell you. And anybody who ever worked with Jerry will say that about him. And it's 100% true. He's not... He's not like a really good guy, but every once in a while he was, he was, uh, you know, not a good guy. He was, he was just a really genuinely good guy. And mm -hmm. he carried, I've, I've said before that he, he's the, one of the main reasons that I got into, that I ended up doing 14 years of service with the union. You know, Jerry got me into that. He, he taught me to care about my fellow actors and what was going on in our studio and other studios mm -hmm. in New York and L.A., right. uh, particularly in the world of daytime television, uh, and, and to step up to the plate and, and uh, stand up for people, stand up for my fellow actors, you know, in situations. And, and, um, and he... Uh, he had been the after deputy on our show for many years, which was the actor's representative for the union uh, that acts as a go between between the producers and the union or the actors and the producers. So the actors come to the deputy and the deputy goes to the union and the union goes to the producers. And, you know, there's a whole kind of line that happens there. Right. And then he asked me to step in for to that position when he just couldn't do it anymore. And that got me started. And then I was, uh, Later, you know, asked to be on the local board of in New York and the national board of of SAG. Of then after in in uh, the national board, and then when SAG after merge, when the merger happened, I was the first national vice president uh, for actors and performers in SAG after. Right. And after that, I left. After a couple of years of that, I left because I had been doing it for fourteen years and I felt like I'd done it enough. But 
you know, he was a pretty big influence for me and a mentor in the studio in terms of, you know, not only just being an actor's actor, but just being a, a good guy to work with. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I had the pleasure of having him on two times. I did one with him and Liz and I did a Spalding reunion with him in it as well. And he was just a down to earth, nice guy. You know, I love what he did as Ross and one mm -hmm. like to live as well. I mean, he was, you know, God in Light has had many veterans on for many years, including you and Kim and him. He was on this since 1979 before y'all came. And it was like, mm -hmm. you know, veterans and, and he was one of them i always i jokingly told him i i could i could have seen him as president of the united states you know uh, he could have saved the world <laughs> maybe maybe yeah he's a good guy yeah um have you been in touch with uh jordan clark how is he doing i i don't know today how jordan's doing i i i'm sad to say i have not been in touch with jordan in in uh i don't think i've you know i keep I'll just, I have to get him on the phone, but I have no idea how he's doing. And I'm really sorry to say that the last I saw him was a couple of years ago, even, I think. Um, but I haven't heard anything. It's, you know, yeah, all out of touch with people. It's just, you think you're going to be in touch all the time and, and then you're not, but, yeah. but you just reminded me as I get reminded every once in a while, Oh, I got to give, I, I got to get in touch with Jordan and see how he's doing. Yeah. What is your plans uh, so far for the year? I mean, um, I know the last thing I've seen you, um, somebody posted you did an episode of Law and Order. Is anything you going to work on to into the, right now as far as theater or film? Well, I kind of laid low after YNR last year. I did shoot the Law and Order, or, or sorry, the, um, yeah, Law and Order thing. I also shot uh, just a small thing on an episode of a, of a new Apple TV series called Extrapolations that's coming out soon. It has to do with, uh, it's like a futuristic look at climate change. Um, I worked with um, Diane Lane and Kit Harrington, mm -hmm. Jon Snow. Uh, so I had a nice couple of scenes with the two of them. So that'll be out uh, later. Um, and right now I'm starting to look at different theater gigs here and there. I'm, I'm always... Uh, I'm always uh, up for and auditioning for, you know, guest spots on. It's weird. I have a love hate relationship though with television right now. I, uh, these, these guest star roles that you do, um, they're just, they pay the bills, but they're not terribly fulfilling mm. just that way. And, and actually that law and order is a good example where when I, when they first uh, reached out to me for that role, there were three scenes involving this prison warden right um who was really struggling with the death of one of his uh police officer one of his uh, uh officers in, in the prison and uh and by the time they hired me it was two scenes and then when i got to the set it was one scene hmm. uh, on a witness stand so yeah you, you know you, you, and that's happens on that happened with um what was it chasing Amy? What was the name of that show? The uh, it's on last year, I think that's right. But uh, I, I had a guest spot on a on a show that where uh, the entirety of my appearance on the show was me opening the front door to a guy's house and saying, "Oh, hello, young lady, are you lost?" or something like that. <laughs> that again, that was three. There were three or four scenes when I first read for that. And then mm -hmm. there were that was cut down to two. And then when I got there, it was just that one scene. Right. And you kind of go, and I get that because they're telling that, you know, you're you are you're guesting on a show. They're telling a story about all the other characters on the show. It's not your story. But right. I, I just find with a lot of those single episode things that there's just again, back to the arc that I was talking about earlier, there's no arc to play. Right. You're just in there saying a few lines of dialogue and leaving. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't find that particularly interesting or fulfilling um i think i'm gonna tr try to stay more focused on theater work around the country um you know there's some things i'm up for now but i, I never talk about anything until i've signed on the dotted line so right. but there's a couple of theater things that i'm really interested in right now um 
that, that are sort of irons in the fire. And then, and then the guest spot nighttime stuff just comes, you know, every week I get a different uh, request for an audition for something. And, right. you know, I live in a normal actor's world where you, you have to do 20 auditions to get one thing. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I have this long, extensive background in television. Mm. I still have to audition for things and, and you still just, I, I audition now and I just assume I'm not going to get the role. It's just easier for me to handle it mentally that way. Mm. Um, and all auditions now are self tapes where the, my agent sends me the scene. And this is true for theater too. Uh, I tape the scene. I have downstairs in my basement. I have a, I have a blue backdrop and I have some lights set up and a tripod and my wife and I go downstairs, my wife, Britt, who was an actress herself way back on loving back in the day. Oh. And uh, she reads the lines opposite me and we, we tape, we tape scenes. I come upstairs, I transfer them to this laptop I'm talking to you on right now and right. I'm on the iMovie and edit them. And then I upload them to a thing that the casting director sends me and they go up to the casting director and my agent. And okay. I either go back or I don't. And that's how actors work now. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of music do you listen to? Um, well, I can tell you this, that I was just having a conversation with a friend about um, the New Year's Eve parties. Mm -hmm. that are on television. And we were just laughing about it. He's about my age. How We don't know any of the of the singers that they have. I don't know any of the acts, any of the bands, you know, it's like, I just don't pay attention anymore to current music, you know? So I'm always locked into my old, you know, I, I'm Pete. Most people know I'm a Springsteen fan through and through. And, you know, I've seen him in concert 10 times or something like that. And my boy, so, you know, so I'm still always listening to Springsteen. Um, and then, uh, you know, just, Sting and Elton John and Rod Stewart and Stevie Wonder. And, you know, these were the guys I grew up with, the people I grew up with. And then going back to like Janis Joplin and the Mamas and the Papas and the Turtles. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> constantly enamored by how great music has been. And I, and I have no opinion on how music is today because I, I hear so little. Most of what I hear in music today is on soundtracks of films that I watch. Right. But I just don't follow current. I couldn't tell you. I can't tell one diva from the next. You know, I'm just, the same. I'm the same I, way. I'm old school. Yeah. And back when they started with boy bands, I couldn't tell one from the next. I just didn't care. Uh, I just like good old rock and roll, man. I just watched uh, George and Tammy, uh, the multi-episode uh, thing on um, George Jones and Tammy Wynette. And uh, I'm not a country guy, but that was right. Cool. I did enjoy seeing, um, uh, what's her name, who just was at the White House getting a Ooh. award, Amy, Amy Grant. Okay. I did enjoy it. I've liked Amy Grant over the years and I enjoyed seeing her getting honored at the White House uh, uh, last month. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I'm a fan of her too, you know, because, you know, she's a, a Christian singer now. And before that, I knew her from. Um, she she was a Christian singer then. <laughs> and then she well, got more secular. She gets, I, she's become more secular over the years. Right. Yeah. Well, I've seen her sing with Peter Katera from Chicago, and, mm -hmm. and that's where I knew her from, from that. And then right. I found out, oh, okay, she's a gospel singer. I didn't didn't know that. But. Yeah, no, but I listened to her gospel back then, too. Mm -hmm. it's pretty, and my, she still has my favorite Christmas album, which is Tennessee Christmas. So, Reverend Josh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did a tribute video to you, sir. Are you ready to see it? Sure. Okay. It's a... Song that they played when they did a tribute to Guy and White back in 2002. I used that, so here we go. There are places I remember all my life. Oh, some have changed. Some forever, not for better, and some have gone, and some remain. All these places have their moments, with lovers and friends I still can recall, 
I even got the clips of you on Santa Barbara and GH. And I gotta say, you and Crystal look very comfortable in that that bid. And I'm, I'm a GL fan. I don't even remember that when I came across it. I'm like, I don't remember that. I, that's interesting. <laughs> I love Crystal. Yeah, I like working with her on the show. I like working with her from time to time on her her uh, web series now. And you know, but uh, I, I I love Crystal. You know, you were talking before about um, improv asking about improv. I don't know that we, I wouldn't call it improv, but we did some ad libbing from time to time. And big galumph was definitely me. That was definitely not written in the script. <laughs> when I said that to Billy, that was definitely right. written in the script. Yeah. I also remember that moment, that thing about pulling Reva into the hot tub like that. And, you know, we talked so much about that before we did it. Cause that's, that's a one take thing mm -hmm. where you got to get it right you know, in one take, because otherwise she's going back to wardrobe and hair and you, you got to, you know, stop everything for an hour to do a second take. So, right. And, and none of us really knew if she might get hurt <laughs> <laughs> in that. Uh, but she was just a hundred percent, you know, gung ho, like she's is about everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just went for it and it worked out pretty great, you know? And then was that uh, John, was it? John C. Riley on Santa Barbara or General Hospital? Oh, that was uh, General Hospital. Yeah, and that was that John Riley. Is that his name? Yeah, yeah he was a he's a sweet guy. He was a sweet guy. Yeah, yeah, I remember liking. He and I got along great when I was shooting that show. Yeah, he was one of the good things about that. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know I had that scene twice with you flipping Kim into the water, but I remember just looking at that. Um, I've seen it, you know, over the years, but it's just like, uh, like wow, he he just you just took. Yeah. yeah, that was just strong guy. That was just 100 percent going for it. You know, there was I don't even think there was a stunt person in the studio that day for that. I think we just did it. Yeah. And I, and I don't even I'm not even sure it wasn't. Uh, my idea, it probably was my idea, you know, that uh, I, don't, I don't remember what the script said. I think there was something about he, he pulls her into the hot tub. And I, th I think we just talked about like what if i just 
you know, bring her right over my shoulder and it worked. Nobody yeah. got hurt. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One take guy, you know? Um, well, even yeah. with though, even with those, you know, we had stunt men a lot back then, and because uh -huh. uh, I was getting beat up a lot back then too, especially when Josh was a bad guy. And I remember we had a thing when when uh, John Wesley Ship uh, threw a punch at me. And, really? Uh, they had put together this table where they had scored the legs, so that the idea was that he would. I think he he actually threw me down, threw me back onto a table. And the table would collapse under me. Mm -hmm. but they had specifically told me it was it was designed so it would it would kind of collapse twice, so it wouldn't just be a, too jarring for me. And uh, he either pushed me or punched me, and I flew back on the table, and the whole thing just disintegrated under my body, and my back hurt for like a week. I mean, you just never know with stuff like that when something small is going to go wrong. And I was young then, and. You know, I was probably all 25 years old then and in pretty great shape. And but I still got hurt doing it. You never know. Right. And I remember John and I, there's another John thing. We were doing a scene on location on an island on St. Croix, I think. Mm -hmm. And both of us ended up with bloody feet. And we found out later that the deserted beach we were shooting on was was a big haunt for party people. And there was broken oh. spreads of broken bottles. Golly. all over the place. And we both were like. Hey, Robert, your feet are bleeding. And I'm like, yeah, John, your feet are bleeding too. <laughs> and we had had a fight there too. And we had blood on, a, you know, just different parts of our body because we were rolling around in this glass strewn uh, sand. Yeah. Well, I got to say, thank God you didn't uh, break any toes. And that um, it wasn't in the clip, but the scene where, uh, it was in 88. It was the, the, the island scene with you and Kim, and you were shirtless. I was kissing in the water, and you was running around. And With Kim? Yeah, it, it was in the 80s. You, she was trying to save Josh from drowning, and then I ended up getting oh, back right. together. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say thank God that day I didn't hit no bottle, because that was a lot of running and tripping around. y'all. Yeah, years. I had scenes, I remember, with um, Cassie in water. Where I pulled her out of the water, the, the with Nicole Forrester as Cassie, mm -hmm. I pulled her out of the water. Yeah, they, that was a different time when they would they would build like a pool. I remember if the one you're talking about, Bruce Berry directed that, and they built a big swimming pool there. And he actually developed a it w it wasn't a camera that went underwater, but he developed some kind of mirror system where you could put point down with the camera, and the mirrors would would shoot underwater. And it was also supposed to be a snowy, fake snowy day. So if you go back and look at that scene now, you'll see a lot of fake plastic snowflakes floating through the water while we're underwater. <laughs> I got a fun. I don't remember yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. It's just all that stuff that happens backstage that people, you know, you hope people don't know anything about or don't notice. But there's always weird things that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I got to say, Robert, you know, um, thank you for the legacy that you've done. I mean, you've got quite, you know, Josh and Kirk, Preston, Ashlyn and the Primetown Rolls um, Theater. You, you know, you even as Josh, I mean, you when you left in 84 the first time or the second time, you could have just said that's it. But you, you came back and stayed till the very end and you, you left one legacy and you know like me who's a gl fan you know having you guys on over and over again you know i love it's just y'all thank you for what you've done over the years well, thank you I, i'm thankful for all of it and i feel like i was very very lucky very blessed to you know i make a living at this and i you know there are thousands tens of thousands of actors in my union who don't make a living at this mm. you know i i'm in the top five percent probably of making a living at this and uh and that includes all the multi-gazillion dollar tom cruises of the world you know and uh but um somehow i've always persevered and managed to continue working you know all the time um and i just feel like uh I'm, i just feel like uh i'm just blessed that's all and I'm thankful for fans, too. I really am. You know, I do a lot of these cameos now where people can go on to Cameo and they can get a personalized message for a friend for their birthday or something like that. 
and in almost every one of them, I just say, you know, that I, I realized a long time ago that what we do on our side of the camera has very little meaning. It has very little purpose without people like you who watch the show. You know, I, I jokingly say to people when I meet them on the street, thank you for helping put my children through college. Um, but it's true. You know, I mean, I, I, it took me a lot of years to get there of like, of really respecting and appreciating people who, who really watch these shows or people who come out and go to the theater that matters in my business because without that, again, what we do means nothing. Mm. It's, it's nothing without people who actually become involved and watch. And then in the case of soap opera, actually become part of our family. Right. And so I also like to say to people, you know, Guiding Light went off now, what, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, maybe? Yeah. I, wanted to, I say to people, yeah. like, I'm, de I, I'm guessing you miss us. And just so you know, we miss you too. We just do. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, people are always really, really gracious to me. Right. There's a little different dynamic with people I met while I was playing Ashlyn there on Young and the Restless because that comes with the territory of playing a bad guy. <laughs> You know, but um, but even those people were always really gracious to me. And they would say, you seem like such a nice person. How can you play such an evil character? <laughs> I, I mean, it's a role. That's, you know? that's, what, that's what they paid for. That's what they're paying me for. <laughs> right. Well, you know, you now uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Now, th thanks. Mm. You. <laughs> well, I think I'm probably done with daytime, but you never know. We'll see. Right. Uh, but I'll be out there doing theater <clears throat> gigs. I'll always have stuff posted on my Facebook page and Twitter and all that for so people know what's going on. I do want to make sure I get a, co a copy of that clip package you just paid for me. I'd like to have that. And I think my mom would get a kick out of that. So, oh, the one I just did for you? Yeah. Send, yeah. Make sure you send one off to me. I uh, most definitely and I, and will. I appreciate it too. I like that. It, that was really nice. No problem. It, it got me kind of worked up over here a little. <laughs> a little little teary eyed on this side. Yeah, I, I meant to get yeah, it. Did a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was young. <laughs> I can see, man. I forget how I'm young I was when I started. You know, I was young. I was twenty two years old when I started in this business. Yeah, you know, and I, you know, like I said, it's a legacy. You know, you touch some. You guys were touching me, fan. That, that's what I was going to say. I, we miss you too. You know, I mean, it's not. You know, um. I'm not not to go on rambling, but you know, it's not it's not like the '80s. You know, if you left one soap, you could go to another one. It was more soaps on. Now it's down to four, and because, yeah. and, and you know, all my children wanted to live. They did a temporarily reboot online, but that didn't last long. It's like, yeah. and people have asked, could there be a reboot? Could it do it again? And who would come back? You know, it's you know, and now it's only four shows. Now it's like you know, just people wonder where is everybody at. I don't think they'll ever go to a five episode a week format for anything ever again yeah once these four shows are gone that's going to be the end of that uh, format you know soaps press on because if you consider the shows that you watch uh a nighttime you know downton abbey is a soap opera you know uh my wife and i are watching all creatures great and small on PBS, it's a soap, it's a soap opera. It's based on a novel, but it's a soap opera. You know, the soap the soap opera format mm -hmm. continues on. Pretty Little Lies was a soap opera. It just was, you know, it's it's more, it's a bigger budget and higher profile people, but it's a, but it's a soap opera. So the 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 idea of soap opera goes on. Right. But the five episode a week, 250 episodes a year. No. Yeah. There, there, there won't be a new version of any of that. Right. Ever. Uh, maybe, maybe a half hour show like uh, Bold and the Beautiful, maybe. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just don't think the numbers work anymore. Right. Robert, thank you for coming by today. You know, I appreciate this and talking with you. You know, um, you know, seeing you as Ashton Locke on Why and I was like, you know, I really got to get him back now because we. <laughs> well, thank you we, for the invite. I always, you know, I always appreciate you too, man. No problem, man. And um, you know, like I said, thank you again for your for what you did as Josh and now Ashlyn and everything else you've done. You know, um, I, I told I keep in touch with Tina like 
all yeah. the time still. She's a good friend of mine. It's her and Mark Dorwin, you know, all the time. And and Morgan too. He 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 sends me a message every time we do something new with his music. And I tell them and you the same thing. It's like, you know, I was a fan of you guys. Y'all got me through my trouble years in school from being bullied. And it's like I, I always would come home and watch the soaps and see you guys. It's like y'all, you know, y'all, y'all my friends, you know. That's even nice. even now, it's like, you know, y'all I thank you guys. Y'all the best. Well, thank you. No problem. Well, I'm a um I'm gonna end this and I'll bring you back in one second. But thanks for coming on for me today, Robert. And right. um, you know, I'll be right back with you. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> I was going. I was. Did I was going to say? Did you want to say anything to the fans, real? Quick? No, I. You know, I. Um. Just a special, just a shout out to the YNR fans, I think, you know, who uh, I think were a little unsure about me at the beginning of that run, but I think uh, for the most part came on board with me on that journey. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, uh, I appreciate uh, the, uh, all the discussion about, you know, when I, when I left that show and uh, people were, not happy about that. And that actually made me feel pretty good. It made me feel like I was doing something right. So uh, uh, just a shout out to the uh, YNR fans to say thank you. And then, uh, you know, I, there's, I don't have to do a shout out to the Guiding Light fans because they're always on my mind. And, uh, you know, I'm always thankful that people, the generations of people who watched Guiding Light over the years, it's just, uh, it's just fantastic. So yeah. I'm I'm always thankful for that. I don't regret any of it, and I'm 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 glad to have had that career that I had. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me on. No problem. I'll be with you in one second. Well, guys, thanks for tuning in today. It's been a great day at Slick. I bet you, PE Slick podcast. Um, I got a another special guest coming aboard. Uh probably sometime later in a few weeks or next month who i think fans will get kicked out of he did a, a movie based on a child's children's tv show we watched growing up in the 90s i'm not gonna say who it was a surprise but anyway thanks again for tuning in um i'm thankful to the fans who've been watching for the last oh i guess now going into four years since i've been doing this podcast i'm thankful for that my so family who's been coming on and um until next time, have a good day, be safe, and uh, Ranger Matt, I went off into the West. <laughs>